You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Gary Sacco. Gary Sacco has worked for 30 years as a cybersecurity specialist. He currently works for a large global technology company. His published paper, A 1,574-Day Periodicity of Transits Orbiting KIC 8462852 with the Journal of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, predicted a possible periodicity of the objects around KIC 8462852. Gary lives in South Florida with his wife and five children. Gary Sacco, welcome back to the program. Hey, John. Happy to be here again. Gary the star has been active. It has been sort of doing these 1% sort of sawtooth dips since we last talked, actually. Does the data that we have been seeing coincide with your prediction of periodicity? Yeah, good question. So in at the highest level, I think it does. We certainly have made a good prediction for September 10th. We had, uh, as you know, in the last session, we talked about a dip occurring around that period and it was significant. And it was the first real activity that we had seen through the LCO network in a long time. So, you know, there's a long stretch of time where we were seeing no action, no activity from the star. We knew we were coming up on a period when we thought the star would get active again. Because if you remember 4.3 years ago, 2017, there was a series of dips and activity stretching from May all the way to September of that year. And 4.3 years before that, we had a very violent episode of dips recorded through the Kepler Space Telescope in 2013. Um, and so in a paper that I had written um, along with a few others, we had predicted the return of the original Kepler dips that occurred starting there in 2013. We expect them to return. Well, they, they returned in 2017. We expect them to return essentially now in September and running them, running through October, November, and December. And first dip we expected to see happen was on September 10th. That appeared to happen. Furthermore, there have been there's been some activity since then there's been some as you say salt to one percent dips observed by different observers so bruce gary has observed a number of small dips ranging from 0.5 percent up to close to one percent you have barbara harris with avso as an observer observing dips um also in that range and actually a little deeper than that and then LCO has also had the same sort of activity over that period of time. The dips, you know, other than the September 10th period, which seemed to be pretty close to what we observed in 2017, the dips since then hasn't been as deep. So we were looking for a, a deeper dip in October 13th. We did see some activity. Bruce Gary saw some activity around a half a percent or so. We had Barbara Harris observed some activity at that period in LCO, certainly showed that in I-band, less successful at B-band, which had, a, I think, a problem with the filter, but we had some activity around that period of October 12th, 13th, and 14th. So we have three different observers seeing some activity around that period, but not as deep as we saw in 2017. So the question then becomes why? Why wouldn't it be as deep? Well, if you remember, just kind of going back, to 2017, when we saw those dips, they were not as deep as the ones from 2013. So what we appear to be seeing is the dips are less deep. So the overall light curve may be becoming a little bit more bumpy with these short-term dips. That may be consistent with whatever is there is continuing to erode in a way, right? So that you see the dust is spreading out it's becoming shallower in, in its orbit. 
does this support a collisional model? Meaning that say we've got objects sitting there smashing into each other and creating smaller and finer dust, but does that conflict with say the uh, observations of different wavelengths of light, which seem to show that this is very, very fine dust already. Mm -hmm. you know, that's exactly, I mean, you said, you, you said it exactly right. So that's, that's, that it, that does raise some conflicts to the model. Also the fact that we're not seeing again, infrared, but well, I would say though, that, you know, given that the star was so quiet and we're seeing the activity again, exactly in the same period that we saw 4.3 years ago, and then exactly 4.3 years before that, it does appear to be in orbit. I mean, this is the third, the, the third observational period, third cycle, if you will, of seeing something come back as predicted. So it does seem to be in orbit. We can't quite explain why you know, the fine dust would still be there. Something obviously must be creating new fine dust. The collisional model is conflicted because we're not seeing infrared. And again, there's there's fine dust there. Unless it's just continuing more collisions and there's more fine dust on a continuous basis. But a collisional model also would imply a an event happening and not really happening over and over, but happening, say, 10 years ago, we see these big deep dips in the Kepler data. And then over the years, it sort of gets lesser and lesser as everything dissipates and, and moves around, except 1978. Tell us what happened in 1978. Yeah, so it's interesting. If you, you know, in the, in the paper, we, you know, we were trying to pull together as much evidence as possible around periodicity. So if you look back to 1978, there was a dip on October 22nd, in fact. 1978. And the reason why we all know that is because we had two different analysis done by two different people. One by Castellez, who produced a paper and published it as well as Hipke. And so Castellez used Maria Mitchell Observatory photographic plates and through that analysis identified a dip that occurred on October 22nd, 1978. And I think he recorded an almost 8% of a dip on that, on that date. And then Hipke also found the same thing, this time using different observatories, photographic plates. This was through the, da the DASH digital archive that's managed by the uh, Harvard College Observatory. And also he used Sonnenberger, so another observatory. So we have three different observatories, all seeing a dip somewhere around 8% that occurred on October 22nd, 1978. So why is that date so important? Well, it's important because if you take this 4.3 year periodicity, or 1,574.4 days, and you multiply it by nine, so nine essential, essentially nine rotations around the star, if it was, if these objects were traveling at that 1,574.4 days, you would end up on exactly Kepler day 1568. Now, Kepler day 1568 is a sizable dip that occurred during that 2013 year period, the period that we're in right now. So the, it, you know, it, it matches precisely. I mean, you go to, you go to that day, 1568, and you minus the 1,574.4 times nine, and you end up exactly on October 22nd, 1978. That's awfully coincidental, <laughs> awfully coincidental, given we also now have two consecutive cycles right? A 4.3 days of where we're having activity. So we've had activity in, 19, in, in 2013, 4.3 years later, we have activity in 2017, 4.3 years later, we have activity now in 2021 as predicted. You go back, take 4.3 years times nine minus that 2013 date, and you end up exactly for dip 1568, you end exactly on October 22nd, 1978, where you have three different observatories seeing a dip somewhere between six to eight percent so that is you know you you could call some things coincidental but now that we're seeing what we're seeing now 
and you add that to the mix, it becomes to me so compelling. It's hard to dispute at this point that there's that that period is is accurate. Now that period would place the whatever is obscuring the star, the dust that would place it in the habitable zone of the star, right? Yeah. Yeah. About 2.9 astronomical units. And it's worth remembering Tabby star is a type F, so it's a little bit bigger, hotter star than mm -hmm. um, the sun. So the, a habitable zone is going to be a little further out. Yeah, exactly. This this would put it on the outer edge of the habitability zone. So it's not in the middle of it. It's on the very outer edge of it, but it's still in that zone. What about there? There were also reports of photographic plates going back over 100 years that also seem to show activity but there's less you know you don't have three observatories you got one or something like that yeah. what uh what do those tell us yeah so there so Casales also in the photographic plates found another dip that occurred on october 21st 1935 and using again if you take that date august 30 oh, i'm sorry august 21st 1935 and you take the 1,574.4 period, day period, you multiply it by 18, you end up exactly on Kepler day 1542, which is another dip during that 2013 period that we're in right now. So remember there were three main dips observed by Kepler. There was one on day uh, 1519, one on about day 1542, and another one on day 1568. So essentially using these photographic plates, they were able to identify those two dips, which I'm going to say uncoincidentally, because I don't think it's coincidental at all, end up exactly matching where you'd expect them to be if you had a 1,574.4 day period. Just now, enough. Yeah, I'm sorry. just as an observation. Yeah, sure. This this shows this shows the usefulness of archiving. 1935 yeah. data from 1935 is being used in 2021 to help figure out this star. Uh, there will be people 5,000 years in the future looking back at the Kepler data for things that mm -hmm. we can't even we can't even suspect will happen. Just goes it's just amazing what the value of archiving data is. Now with the star going back that far. We have a an obvious long term dim that all the photographic plates seem to show, and that seems to suggest that material is accumulating in the star system, and that we're seeing clumps or something like that. But there's also just this dimming trend. But some of the data has shown, especially recently, there was one one data point that showed an almost total recovery for just a few hours. So the dust parted. Is there? Do you have any insight on what what's going on with that? Who's the observer for that? That was Bruce Gary. Yeah, and, yeah. and he wrote something on it regarding his yeah. web, website. Yeah, I think I. So okay, yeah. So I have seen Bruce's data where he shows some some what appears to be a clearing, a total clearing where we see a, a recovery, a baseline. But even with that, his baseline doesn't right, date back to. Well, you know, hundred years from hundred years ago, that that's just a, a recovery from a period of a few years, and I don't know. I think if we were going to say that that actually happened, we're going to need multiple observ observations to see that. Bruce does a lot of great work, and so he says he saw it. I I believe it, but you know, of course, anytime you have. Anytime, anytime you want to rely on something, you're going to need multiple obser observations of it to be able to use it for significance. Uh, it, but if it did happen, right, then again, it, it, it's a clearing based on a baseline of when he started his observations, which doesn't really go back too, too far. And so it's not like that clearing represents a clearing of 20%, say, is what we would have seen the total dimming of the stars since the, the turn of the prior century. That's an awfully huge amount of <laughs> dimming of right, right, right. Now, if Bruce had said, "Okay, he saw a clearing and it rose twenty percent brightness," then now that would be really eye-opening. That's I don't think that's what he said. What is the future? What on this period? What's going to happen in 
in your view mm-hmm. over the next uh, I don't know five years? Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. One, well, before I get right jump right to that, we've got another prediction coming up for November third. It was the smallest of the three dips in 2013 from Kepler, and it was it was very subtle during 2017 even, and by LCO. So if it's true that these that the dust is dispersed and the dips are getting more shallow, then it will be challenging to detect this, especially since we're kind of in a period where we're just down on a day-to-day basis at this point. We're down like 0.5%, down 1% at times. Last night, we did an observation, LCO, and we were down about 1.4% in B and 07 or so percent in I band. So the thing's just down, but that's very consistent. If you look at the Kepler data and if you look at 2017 LCO data, it's kind of what we saw. We saw the star just down during a two month period, 60 day, 70 day plus period. The star was just down. It was as if it was a big debris field, lots of dust. And you had these peaks of dust in certain areas. So we'll see what happens on November 13th. Uh, no, I'm sorry, November 3rd coming up in about a, what, 10 days or so. We'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to see if it, if we see just even a little more additional bump than we're seeing right now. We're down again about a half percent or so. If we see a little bit more, that could be an indication that that's whatever is there is a little bit more dusty. And then we have a final dip on December 1st, 2021 that was observed by LCO in 2017 and by Kepler in 2013. So in 2017, they called it Sarabri, Scarabri, sorry. And in 2013, this was day 1568. This is the one that happened in 1978 too. It was detected in 1978. So we shall see. That one's interesting because it was the deepest dip recorded by LCO. Uh, So again, if we're seeing diminishing uh, dust, then It'll be smaller, but it will be more significant to detect. Maybe as significant as the one we saw in early September, what, a month or so ago. It is a tough time of the year to observe the star because it is getting closer and closer to the horizon. That's going to be a challenge to get that observation in, but it's possible if we have the right conditions, we have really clear skies, it is possible to see on one of our observatories at LCO. And I'm sure Bruce Gary will be looking at that time too, hopefully. And we have AVSO also hopefully be checking. So we'll, we'll just see what happens. So we still have some more dips to come that have been predicted. We will just have to wait and see. Now, further down the road to your question about four or five years from now. So 4.3 years from now, we should see these things return again. A couple things. One, in that at that time, it'll be the winter months of the Northern Hemisphere. It, the star will be close to the horizon. At, at points, at some points, even maybe unobservable by the ground. We could, you know, in theory, by that point, you know, who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll have a, a space telescope observing, maybe even James, James Webb. <laughs> Not sure about that, but, it, you know, it'd be great if we had something like that going to see it during those winter months where we can't see it from the ground. There is the final dip, this day, 1568. We'll come back around in 4.3 years during a period where we can see from the ground, I think in March in 4.3 years. So we will get an an opportunity to catch that one. What if, and this is a question, not an answer. What if when these dips come back in 4.3 years, they're deeper again. So we just, we, we saw in 2013, very, very unusual deep dips, the 20 plus percent in some cases. And then in 2017, we saw them come back with perfect timing. The exact right timing is when we'd expect them to come back, but they were much shallower. And now in 2021, it seems like they're even shallower still. Question is, when we get to 4.3 years from now, what if they're deep again? How could that be? How could that be possible? And I ask that question because remember, on October 22nd, 1978, the dips were about eight, the dip detected was about 8%. That was the same depth that we saw Kepler's dip in 2013, the exact same depth, in fact. So, how's that? How would that? So, it seems like 
1978, you had the object at 8%. And then in 2013, it's also at 8% and suddenly it dissipates. Sort of doesn't make a lot of sense if this is a collision model. And I'm just wondering, this is highly speculative, of course, but when you get to a point where it's hard to explain things, you've got the secular dimming, which is hard to explain in conjunction with these short-term dips. You start to start to think of all possibility and speculation. But I'm just wondering, what if we saw this come back in a lar- back to eight percent again? Day 1568 come back again at eight percent in 4.3 years. That would be extraordinarily strange. But if you do the math and you look at October 22nd, 1978, and you take three cycles of 4.3 years, and you, you, and you, and you, you, you do those three cycles, which is we've essentially we've had with 2013, 2017, 2021, you repeat those three cycles over and over again, you end up with 8% coming back again as predicted using three cycles in 2013. So if we did the same math, three more cycles from 2013, yes, you'd end up in 4.3 years from now back at 8% again. Now, if that happens and it's highly speculative, and I'll be waiting to see what happens like everyone else, I think we'll be in a place where we'll just be, it'll be too strange to be natural, I think, at that point. And that is what this star does. Just when you think that you're you're like, okay, this appears to be natural, just some weird juxtaposition, and then all of a sudden it it does something else and blows any of the, the accumulated uh, hypotheses out of the water and it's back into strange territory. There's a reason why so much attention has been put on the star because it just doesn't like to behave the way that we predict. Now, if it did that and we suddenly see the creation of, of more dust, you know, big dips again, mm-hmm. which that given that this was happening in 1978, that seems to be something that the start does. Then you have to start asking questions about alien civilizations doing something. And in this case, there are a couple of uh, speculative options. Now, this is high speculation. And remember, I'm a science fiction author, not a scientist, so I can talk about this stuff. But so what would be consistent from an alien perspective, an astrobiological perspective? What would be consistent with this asteroid mining? Yeah. Yeah. So, I I mean, I, I if you needed materials, elements from a star, you would you would mine the star, essentially. Uh, and there's a there there is theory behind that. Not my theory, but others, much smarter than me, that you know, envision the possibility to use really high power powered magnets to essentially create you know solar flares, if you will. Again, okay, it's the simplest way to think about it, and you know, control them, put them in orbit, let them cool, and then then mine it. Now, the question would be, you'd have to have equipment to do that work. And then you'd have to have different equipment to do the mining work. So in my mind, where would you want to position if you're doing this right from just thinking about any solar system? This is the thing you do. You go to solar systems to sort of harvest from stars. Where would you do this? Well, you probably would want to, you probably would want to do this where the equipment extracting material from the star is on the opposite side of the star where you're mining right because you've got all sorts of, you don't want solar flares are pretty especially to the magnitude this would be are, are probably pretty damaging so you'd want to do it on the opposite side of the star and then over a period of years have that object as it cools migrate over to the other side of the star where mining will occur and and of course, mining would you'd want to have extract the materials that you want, the elements that you want, and the things you don't want. Ensure that it's very fine dust so that it blows out of the system quickly. Does this give a mechanism for why no infrared is observed? In that the material is just simply too close to the star? Well, n- not really. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we, I don't think that's explainable in any of these in any of that in that scenario I just gave. I don't I don't think that's explainable. I think though, what we're missing is a big dip where we could we could try to measure 
infrared. Uh, we just haven't, you know, we had the Kepler space telescope, right? And there were big dips. We weren't measuring infrared. So, you know, that it's hard. It, you know, I, I would love to see a big dip where we could actually measure infrared to see if we have excess or not. Because maybe we do. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> That that is a problem because if when when were the infrared observations done? I mean, was the star dipping at all, or it, was it just doing the one percent stuff? You know, when the observations for infrared were taken, so it wasn't a big dip that was observed in infrared, right? Right. No, not nineteen, not not in twenty thirteen. No. So, is there a reactive mechanism in place in, with your network to if it takes a dive? You mm -hmm. know to look at it in infrared yeah, while it's doing for sure. That. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if we got a big dip, it'd be a call to arms. The way it works today is, I'm, you know, I'm working, I'm scheduling the, the observations on a normal one week cadence. Of course, this period right now is a little bit hectic, so it's more than one once a week cadence. The project that I'm working on under, under Tabby really, she's, Essentially, the project I'm working on is for secular, secular dimming, and it's rather straightforward. So I schedule the dips. I'm sorry, I schedule the observations, and then I do the analysis using some photometry software from Louisiana State University, and that produces the you know the sort of the flux level. So. It it's not really my eyes and my skill set that's really at work here. Uh, it's the software and the observatory. I'm not even behind a telescope doing this, right? If you think about it. So I, I'm working with Tabby in a very, it's kind of a loose word, loosely way of saying that. Yes, she, you know, I'm, um, she's supporting it. Yes, she's giving me the time with the LCO network through the university. I think when this is all said and done, yes, we'll kind of have some more close dialogue around what the results are. But unless there's a big dip and she's sort of letting me do do, do my thing, right? Sort of letting me schedule the weekly cadence and, and do the analysis, publish the analysis on, on um, a Reddit site that we have. If there was a big dip. I would I would reach out to Tabby immediately. I would let her and others know probably on Twitter and in, in addition, right? Uh, in addition to me just letting her know directly. And that would cascade into that call of arms to for observers to begin observing in all sorts of wavelengths. And, and there's also, of course, the astronomer's telegram too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I mean, it, it there's no doubt if we had a big dip, we would we would we would get we would get the um, we'd get observations in, in many different wavelengths. During those periods of deep dips, you think that given that it's so deep, you'd think that's optically thick, right? So <laughs> that gets back to the old megastructure idea. And if you were to see a blocking of light during one of these events, that's a hundred percent. Then all natural explanations are, are then off the table, correct? Uh, you just noticed the long pause here. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't. Something that big, without infrared, in a in a period of four point three years, I, I guess. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I don't know. I haven't. I, I don't know. I don't know to be honest, John. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I think what the this is actually a, a, a more broader thing because we're starting to, to detect new objects that are doing something related but they're not they are not the star first of all these these new stars that we're finding that that are exhibiting mysterious dipping aren't quite doing it the way tabby star does it but they do present an optically thick profile meaning that it there that looks like a big thick cloud of dust but it could also be a solid object and it's hard to tell if you could tell the difference between a very thick dust cloud and a hard edged object, which I think you can, then if it's a hard edged object, then it's it's something that can't exist in nature. It's something that somebody built. Uh, but if it's a 
if it's a dust cloud that's thick, that presents its own mysteries, you know, because you know yeah, what it, what right. is col- what is colliding yeah. to create this dust, and that's that's the new star that that recently came out just a few days ago, that appears to be objects repeatedly slamming into each other, producing dust clouds that dissipate very rapidly, presenting a different profile every 19.8 days. So this thing keeps going around on a 19.8 day period, but every time it does it, it looks different. And sometimes it's not there at all. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, that is strange, right? Yeah, it's it's the more we look, the more we find these weirdly dipping stars. And I, like with KSEA 4628.52, it may be some time before we have any idea what's going on with it. You know, you have mm-hmm. to wait, you have to wait. But with that star, the star you're studying, it has shown a history of throwing curveballs. So we may, we may, we may be having this conversation in 20 years, basically <laughs> <laughs> still wondering what this is. So is that your gut feeling that this thing's going to do something crazy that throws everything out, 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 out of the water again? I, for some it's hard to say this, but I, I just have this feeling in 4.3 years, we're going to be back to big dips again there. And I think that that, that in itself is perfectly reasonable given the history. And it's very, very hard to explain. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you only have so much material that you can destroy, you know, in a star system. And if you got material that's in that proximity and cascade colliding, it isn't going to do it over centuries and centuries, you know, or, or am I wrong on that? No, I mean, it's the first we've seen anything like this. I mean, you know, when you combine the fact that there's some secular dimming with we saw as these short term dips and it, you know, obviously it could be a debris field of a col- of a, some collision that occurred just before 2013. But, you know, as I just said earlier, the fact that we had what appears to be the same objects back in 1978 and then in 1935, it challenges that there was some collision, you know, some, you know, right before 2013. Why would they both be, why would it still be 8% from 1978 to 2013? It just, that really, you have to assume then there's some coincidence, right? That what we saw in 1978 is just purely coincidental. At eight percent, eight percent is gigantic, right? I mean, let's not forget that a Jupiter-sized planet crossing in front of the star is going to register about zero point five percent. So, in nineteen seventy-eight, something that was the size of about eight percent. So, what is that? That's sixteen times Jupiter's, right? Crossed in, on October twenty-second, nineteen seventy-eight, and then that same-sized object dust cloud apparently was also present for Kepler day 1568 2013 so how then why is it diminishing right in the next the, the next two cycles so it's just um it just leaves you scratch your head right it's very very hard to understand and you also have 1935 and the other plates that seem 1935. to show 35 yeah. and the reason why you don't have a consistent like every 4.3 years you can go back through the archives the plate archives and seeing the dips repeat is because the star wasn't observed every night, right? It just isn't it, through history. It wasn't observed every night. It was just random that the star was actually captured by some observatory's plate. And so we're just lucky that if you go back, well, it's, maybe it's not lucky actually, probably given enough years, hundred years, say in the go back a hundred years of plates, you know, there's going to be some percentage of them are going to be on these exact dates at the dips and so happens <laughs> that there was one there was uh so, you know there was some lineup of observatories that were observing the star on october 22nd 1978 there's only one night there's no plate you can look at looking at the star on october 21st or october 23rd just october 22nd and so it just it, it it's great that we have the historical plates but the reason why you don't have many more than that between those two dates is because they just don't exist. And, and I interviewed uh, the the Vatican's chief astronomer, 
the head of the Vatican Observatory, Brother Guy Consolmagno, and he even mentioned that. He said that, yeah, they came and looked at all the plates that we had. <laughs> so mm. it seems yeah. to have been a very thorough search by the astronomical right. community to look for yeah. whatever plates we possibly could find. Yeah. So anyway, November 3rd is the next date, and then we're done with the observing season. But when does the observing season start again? Well, we're not done yet. Actually, we're going to, we're able to do some observations in, into early December, and there is a, another prediction for December first that we're going to try to catch. But the the season will end usually somewhere around the second week of December. You can't. It gets harder and harder every week. It gets harder and harder. The window to actually observe is it's smaller and smaller and smaller. The star gets closer and closer to the horizon. By the time you get to the second week of December, at least for LCO. We're pretty much done for the season. Some would argue you're kind of done by the first week of, of December. That's why this December first observation should be really challenging. Then you, you then and then and then you can't see it in January. You also there's nothing to see in February. When you get to March, you can start to try again. So usually by mid March, you're good to go. Now I got a, a general question: error bars in observations. How do you guys set those? Yeah, it's, a, it's I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. I think, for, so let me, I'll just explain. Let me, let me, let me walk you through the way it works for, for me and LCO. And it's relatively simplistic. So there is, there's a piece of software that I use from Louisiana State University. I scheduled the observation using LCO network. I take the photographic plates. I run, I do some processing with them. I then feed them into the software and it does all the work. I mean, it does all the work. It produces the error rates. Now I will, there's some, there's some manual things I do do for one. I actually examine each of the plates, the photographs to see if you've got some cloud cover. You can, you can tell even if it's thin cloud cover based on the plate before or the photograph before, I will look at reference stars. So there's a way to include reference stars in the light curve. And if you see the reference stars on your, your field, your star field decline or decline in brightness or increase in brightness in lockstep with your target star, well, you know right away that that's, false positive that that's not a real dip it's not a real dimming because your your reference stars your nearby stars are also dimming at the same rate as your target star so therefore obviously there must be a cloud in the sky right but when you see your reference stars don't move you know they stay at their baseline but your target star dips you know that your one star actually dimmed in brightness so based on the reference stars that you choose and your target star, you can calculate an error, whether how they're moving and how your target star is moving. And fortunately for me, <laughs> this software actually calculates that for me. So it makes it really easy and it makes it really hard for me to screw up, right? And really kind of mess it up where I'm producing bad data. With the star and... Having been a planet hunter and looking through my share of light curves, a couple of light curves, sometimes you can see things like a brightening of a star that, that's interpreted as a solar flare. Do you ever see that, this specific star, KIC 8462852, do you ever see it flare? I mean, I have seen what might look like that at times. I just, it's really hard to say that that's the case. Of course, you know, you, there's only so many pixels. The star is so far away. You get any single photograph of the star itself. For sure, I've seen the, the star look like it's got a flash on one side or the other side. It's really, it's really hard to interpret what I'm looking at when I see that, though. Some, and, you know, and so I, I don't know if I could answer that. It's possible. Now, one last question for you, Gary. Is anybody looking at the star in radio to see if it's it's if there's anything weird going on, whether SETI or just with the star itself or anything like that, is there any active radio observations of the star going on or was it just checked once and they moved yeah, on? None that I'm aware of. Yeah, you're right. SETI did it. And then there was 
it borrowed some time. I think was it Jason Wright from Penn State University borrowed some time at the radio telescope in is it West Virginia, I believe it is. And it produced an enormous amount of data. It took a long time to go through and figure out. And I don't, you know, there was there was nothing unusual that at least was publicly released that was unusually detected. And I, I don't, I'm not suggesting, right, that something unusual would have not been publicly released, but I just, and nothing at least of any significance was ever kind of released. It's interesting that because, I mean, could you probe the star? If you if you have somebody messing with a star, mm-hmm. you know, with through stellar lifting, as we were talking earlier, that's got to produce some weirdness in uh, across the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's almost like if you got to that point, maybe figuring it out, looking at radio might be the thing to do to see if the star is doing this or or spectroscopy on the star itself to see if it's somehow depleted in anything. Those types of studies might be the way of figuring that out. Don't yeah, you? yeah, excellent point. Right, I don't think anyone's looking. I mean, I don't think right now. You know, you know, I think the consensus is something natural. It's dust. I think it's one step at a time. Right now, we've got to show that there's secular dimming going on. I think we'll be able to show that in the near future. We'll be able to confirm that. I should say. I mean, you know, obviously, you've got some other papers out there already showing that. But I think we'll be able to confirm that. And that just tells, that that's an interesting part of the story. And then we have to see what happens with these dips again in 4.3 years. If, if they're back to being large again, I think then you may start to get people to do more of that kind of analysis. Unfortunately, that might, we may have to wait 4.3 years. Yeah, I think the star, the star has to do something, kind of throw another curveball at us that's significant like that for, for people to go look along those lines but it's a, it's a really good thought yep and i tell you you know i've been watching the star since the very first paper came out and it throws curveballs and it's probably going to do it again gary thanks for uh joining us again and i wish you great luck in your observations of tabby thank star thank you john fingers crossed for december 1st fingers crossed i will be in touch thanks for listening i am futurist and science fiction john. author wrong channel no it's not thanks for listening i am futurist and science fiction author john michael godier currently hosting event horizon and wondering where anna actually came from one day i had a tablet computer the next i had a boss very disturbing be sure and that's enough of that youtuber forever like subscribe and hit the bell sell out what